and we were discussing how many people had come into this august room who weren't just highly regarded amongst the, the body of the school and the A and so on, but who were actually famous, or who were known to mums and dads. And we couldn't think of more than two or three people. We said, yes, Frank Lloyd Wright, who's known to have been in this smelly room, and um, perhaps Mies van der Rohe. And we couldn't think of very many more. I'm, I'm never sure whether Basil Spence ever came here. And I think it is, it, it is a serious point in the sense that an architect who has actually can identify with the mums and dads of, of the people sitting here has a very special <coughs> role, very curious responsibility. The second thing is the Centre Bobo is a building which perhaps has tens of thousands of people in it per day. It's probably, there must be a statistic, which I don't wish to know, but there must be a statistic which suggests how many people have been in that building. The building has now reached the role, or is, is it of a comparable role, to the Eiffel Tower, perhaps, or the Queen Mary, or the, I don't know, the, the Temple of Cons of Karnak, or whatever it might be. It has reached that level of, of familiarity, and, and it, it is probably as if it has been there for 500 years already. There again, there must be a tremendous pressure upon the architects who made that object. And the third thing, I suppose, which is a slightly more personal observation, which is of, of all the famous architects that I have met, I think that Richard is the one who is most genuinely liked by the people who work with him and know him. And again, it's not easy to say that. I can think of a lot of real turds <laughs> in, <laughs> who are famous architects. So here is a man who is subject to these kinds of pressures, who, as they say, has to follow that act. He has to follow his own act in several different ways. I first remember Richard uh, making a balsa wood model of a tower, which was purporting to be a hotel, which looked suspiciously like a tower which had been designed by an Italian architect and was already beginning to be hated amongst the fashionable uh, young architects of the A. His tower looked a little bit like the Torre Velasca in, in uh, Milan. And then, of course, it's rather more piquant when we remember that that other tower was designed by his uncle. Again, a difficult act to follow in several senses, in several dimensions. And I think that the final observation that I'd like to make, which is again a parochial one, is that just about the time when it seemed a very nice idea to invite Richard to be one of the external examiners at the AA, was the, the, almost the down point or the up point, depending on how you look at it, of probably the uh, unfashionableness of his kind of architecture in the AA itself. And there's a certain irony there that, that just at the point when mums and dads begin to know this person, he's a very good architect, you invite him to be uh, an external examiner because that seems to be a very useful and nice thing to do. And at that moment, the students are least interested in his kind of architecture. I think the worm in several dimensions has turned, but I am both amused and impressed by the way in which Richard, as always, responds to such situations. He's a very good person at following acts, even if they're his own. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's practically impossible to follow us. Except to say that I do remember that Seaford was here and others, so I don't think that many people have been here, whether they have mums or dads. Um, I'm going to talk about, I notice I'm meant to be talking about Coin Street. I will be talking about Coin Street, but I will actually talk about building and cities, and I think it's called a crisis of place as well, and therefore talk about a certain amount about Lloyd's, a certain amount about Boburg, and of course about Coin Street. I've, I think tonight at last I finished the tenth month of being in the box 
I we cross examined <laughs> on Con Street, not quite constantly, up and down. Um, and I think today is probably the closing day, which I apologise for being late, except that they, in an attempt to actually rush the last five minutes after ten months, they kept me going. Um, <laughs> Well, I always find it difficult to follow something like Peter Cook. In fact, I find the most difficult part of being cross-examined in Con Street is not being cross-examined because it's by the enemy. That's very clear. It's your friends that you have to really be careful about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in fact, my QC who takes me through... In fact, I panic always when at the last moment when the QC is attempting to assist you because I always want, doesn't know how to play. Well, it's nice and easy when everybody's against you. And in fact, the last time I talked here, was on Boberg, and I should think at least 90% of people were sort of practically throwing tomatoes. Um, so I'll have another go this time. Right, can I have the first slide? I'll talk a, lot, a certain amount also about what I see as the responsibility of the designer, architect, team. I believe very strongly in teams. Um, and the role. I do. I mean, I suppose there's a key underlying theme which I shall keep trying to refer to is the fact that I think the architect's role goes way beyond that of answering the client's brief. And it's really a question of questioning, and it's the questioning of that brief. On the right is the knowledge plan, the 18th century knowledge plan of Rome, a section of Rome which shows, as you probably well know, the white area as being area which the public use, public use. Churches, markets, piazzas, palazzos, gardens, and so on. Not shops, because of course in the 18th century shops were much more private than they are now. But I think the total area, I don't remember the figure anymore, is something like 20 or 30 percent of the area is white. And in other words, it is areas where the public could enjoy themselves. And we still go back to that situation. We still go back to Rome. We still go back to Barcelona or wherever it may be to enjoy those cities. Florence, Tuscan towns, hill towns. They have a continuing role, and it is really culture at its best because it gives enjoyment throughout thousands of years, of, and in Rome, of layering of thousands of years, of two and a half thousand years of, of, of interest, which we are, of culture, which we are trying to, hopefully, to defend and to create. On the other side, you have a corner or a piece of London, and even with the vast parks, one must ask oneself, where is there a good place, apart from perhaps Petsford Square, there aren't many actual spaces as against parks. And those red blobs show what I suppose could be considered to be the key places in London. In other words, Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square, where the world goes round. They're all roundabouts, actually, all the points, all the red points here are Westminster. Um, Westminster down here, Marble Arch, Hyde Park Corner, Cambridge Circus, and so on. And each one of these are the key places in London. And what you come down to, the one common denominator is they're great for traffic. Trafalgar Square is actually on a different level and height from, for instance, Leicester Square and Piccadilly. What a fantastic possibility of those three elements, linked possibly by a change in level by steps and so on, it could really create a great place. Instead of that, we have a sort of semi-converted Leicester Square, which always looks as though they can't make up their mind whether it really is a sort of roundabout or whether it's a people's place. And so in the end, one has this whole series of traffic roundabouts as the heart of the city. And I would suggest that the only thing which you can't move out of the city is place, the place you can move out housing, you can move out to the suburbs or to new towns, industry, you can move out anything you can think of. The one thing you can't move out of the city is where people meet, and that's really what all the city's real value is about, is meeting places. 
meeting people. That's one thing you can't really do in the suburbs. There are other advantages of going to the suburbs. So I see the heart of the city as being this place where other people meet, and I see that as being seriously eroded. Next slide, please. Do I have press or something now? The capital, as it was, as it is, as Michelangelo designed it, a conversion job. A great conversion job, because it became one of the great places. It's small, it's tight, the fabulous views. It's a fabulous piece of weaving into the urban texture. Weaving, linking, viewing. All out of this very simplistic sort of couple of sheds. And it's really, I suppose, what we're much more conscious of than we were in the previous decades, certainly when I was in the AA in the 50s. But obviously, whilst the modern movement was so busy battling a very, in my opinion, worthwhile battle about light and sunlight and streets and so on, one of the things that were not created during that period were places for people places for where people could meet face to face. Next. And I see that role of the architect, that role of that really the street, the, the city, is really a form of stage, a stage where people participate in. It's, it's a situation where you have to go beyond the client's brief, 100,000, million, whatever it may be, square feet of um, offices, and create something which is worthwhile at a much broader, in a much broader term. The Thames, one of the great rivers of the world. And what do we do on the Thames? We produce something which I think we might imagine just possibly in the East, probably quite wrongly, as there's appalling development along there, which totally disregards the fact that the Thames is not a private river, it's a public space. It's a place which belongs to the people. And that there's no rights for office buildings to just come down crashing onto a public area. That offices are, in fact, work better above ground than they do at ground, so why should they occupy the ground at all? I mean, Regent Street, the other, the next to the slide over there, as it was, as it, and as it is, has public spaces, public activities, public realm, all through the ground area. Above that, it may be housing, it may be offices. There's nothing wrong with offices, nothing wrong with factories, nothing wrong with, off with, with housing. The institution is not wrong, it's the organization of the institution which is wrong. And so here, I suggest, is one of the crimes of London, perpetuated by, basically, architects. Next. I'm involved in the rebuilding for the well, third-fourth time of Lloyd's in the last 50 years. Lloyd's Insurance London. And on the left you see Leadenhall Market, again one of the classics of London, one of the beauties of London. Fabulous shed with what was obviously and is still partially fabulous shops, but it's dying. It's dying for many reasons. One reason is this, is that obviously the city has become even more a situation of, and I exclude the Barbican for the moment, of purely one activity, an isolated ghetto of office work nine to five. No housing, very little industry, and a minimum amount of shopping, a certain amount of shopping. But on top of that, say Edwin Scooper building of 1928, which is Lloyd's, which is on the right-hand side, um, did something which has become the common way of doing dealing with anything. And that is for the first time in the 1920s, it actually produced an office-type building and banged it into the ground and turned its back on the fact that the street belongs to the public. And that they usually, in tradition, there were shops along here. Sorry, let's see what I have. There were shops along here once. And there were obviously shops along here in this 1950-60 building, Gaster building, over there. 
And by doing that, isolated level four, I made it even more likely that he will die as it is dying, because it's no longer a part of the continuity of the shopping areas of the other parts of the city, and there are other shops. And therefore, what this slide, these two slides say is, but it is possible, if you look at Lloyd's, to recognize that Lloyd's actually, Lloyd's insurance, for instance, is based upon a coffee house. That's where it started in 17-something or the other. There's a coffee house where, um, where bankers met ship owners and bankers insured the cargo. And there's still a very strong atmosphere of the coffee house. And there's a little museum now called the Nelson Collection. And eating is still very important. And about and a very considerable amount of the business of Lloyd's actually goes on in the coffee room of this called the captain's room. Except now in the, that, that, this is the 1928, the further building was built in 1958. In the 1958, even worse, the coffee room is no longer anywhere near the ground, it's actually on the fourth floor. Take a couple of lifts and go down the corridor if you can find it. And it has no public relationship whatsoever. And so what we're saying on Lloyd's, which is just a, an early sketch, is, but why shouldn't the, Lloyd, the office building, the Lloyd's underwriting space, which is a very exciting space, start above ground? Why shouldn't we put the ground back? to public activities and thereby enrich the street. And after all, it also gives us something to work with in the sense of the, of the nature of the scheme, the articulation of the scheme, if you like. Next slide. Can you all hear me? Anyone can't hear me? Um, this is the Lloyd's underwriting space. 1958 building, just to go back for a moment to the 1928 building, which is absolutely opposite it, which is the one I showed you before. Maxwell Fry wrote in 1928 in Country Life, this grand and great building, there's a such abundance of size that he will never, there is no way in which we can foresee Lloyd's ever outgrowing that need. That need was outgrown 10 years later. Um, it's very difficult to foretell what's going to happen within very few years. Lloyd's having, as I said, basically approached us on its fourth development in the century, said in its brief to us, we wish you to build a building which is, has a life of 50 years or more. And we pointed out the difficulties in imagine, and then it said, please suggest the sort of changes you'll see in 50 years. And we pointed out, this is 1978, and I think it was 1928, 50 years beforehand, the first plane that ever flew across the Atlantic. Therefore, the chances of us seeing 50 years ahead was practically, well, practically nil, let alone landing on, on, on the moon or space travel or anything else, or the microchip. All you can do is try to allow, allow for a certain amount of the unforeseen. In other words, we, another point, obviously, which we are very interested in is this whole thing of growth, change, flexibility. People have been highly critical of this, so they produce boring buildings and so on and so on. But I do not believe that. I think it depends how you handle the situation. Like most of the so-called boring warehouses and boring large spaces that I can think of in the past, many of them I enjoy immensely. Um, Lawyers, as I said, is basically a coffee house or, or market. People work selling oranges and lemons or insurances for ships or beautiful legs or whatever it may be. Underwriters buy from or offer rates to brokers who go around trying to get their, their best rates. And so it's a, a market space, a marketplace, which is now amazingly overcrowded. And the game, this was a limited competition, was to find a way in which we could recommend to Lloyds of a strategy, we might see them through a few more, a bit more than 20 years, which has been their standard. And of course, the waste of having continuously <coughs> change buildings is considerable. Waste in time, in the sense of work, and waste of materials in having to, to demolish. And so we looked at the, and we suggested very broadly, and that's, this is the first suggestion, an atrium building, that's the atrium, and standard floors, a whole series of standard floors around it, with sort of cores somewhere around the corners, the cores being toilets, lifts, and so on. But very clearly, the advantage of the atrium building is that it allows you to come moderately close to a minimum amount of external skin for the maximum enclosed area, which is good economically both for the amount of skin, but also in energy terms. The nearer you get to a sphere, 
the less skin you have, the less in or out put of energy, input or output of energy from the outside affects that building. A, a, a square being, or a cube being probably the, I, the ideal. Um, but the other problem is that normally all these cores, which are actually should have been drawn by four times the area, because after all they take something like 20% of the building, then they begin to intervene into that floor space. And we devise that floor space as being pretty standard around this atrium for whether it's offices, whether it would be workshops, or whether it would be a market space. Basically, it's 15 meters across and light from both sides. And as I said, this area all the way here being sort of the usual corridors and all the rest. And they interfere. So what we did was to bring, pull out these elements. And Lloyd's has traditionally about six entrances, and that also happens to be the normal type of fire escape response. Next. And what this shows you is that since the, the, the city itself, the infrastructure, the roads which are in the city, spaces which are really rooms without roofs, they're so tight, they're so dynamic. That's what's so great about going to the city, whether it's in New York, Chicago, or London. It has a sort of quality of, of urbanness which most of the rest of the cities don't have. And those parts, those streets, those rooms without roofs, continue for hundreds of years. Paris, Rue Saint Martin, is a Roman road, it still divides Paris into two. In London, we go, we find four, three, four, five hundred years. Fabric of buildings have also got, on this diagram, some 75 years, 100 years of, le of length. Appliance and mechanical systems, 15 years. Uh, uh, sorry, yes, and maintenance of those every five years. It's very difficult to know where we will be in energy terms. I can be pretty sure that whatever we put in today will be beginning to be ripped out over the next, few, within 10 to 20 years, or whatever we put up in the mechanical services element areas. I said, taking lifts has been a, a, a typical situation. And so what this says is, yes, we can devise a system which may be energy conservative, which may have mass for energy and so on. Quite simply, these are platforms, whether it becomes a workshop, a small uh, university, whether it's a university, a workshop, church, or whatever it may be, that just has just, that's just ground areas. But it's this element out here which we have to be able to rip out without stopping the work that goes on inside. And in Lloyd's, in the end, and Lloyd's the typical, or in the city of London, we're talking about rents, which are so high that really the cost of building is becoming practically unimportant as long as you can pull in the rent fast. 30 pounds a square foot. For every month that we're going to be late on Lloyd's, it's a million pounds. For every month that you have to uproot people working in Lloyd's, it's a part of that million of that pounds. Cost of building actually is very unimportant at that form of inflation rate. Um, that's a tool. It may sound boring, but it's actually a tool that you can use. It's a tool which can, you can use to actually give form to that building if you wish to use that tool. And so what we're saying is, here are the simple planes, here are the simple floor spaces, here are the surfaces, here are the elements they give up, and these are articulated, give light, shadow, form. Next. Next, next. No? And so what we recommend is a simple rectangle with an atrium space, some 30 stories, some one and a half times, well, about a little bit higher than Bowburg is that space. It's a very large space, larger than you can think inside there. And, then, and the building looks inwards because that's the sort of principle, this is the principle of floors. And any number of these floors can become a market space, the market room. Any other floors above that will be offices. And outside that serve, are these servant cores, the servant spaces. To use car language, serving the servant <coughs> spaces around here. And they have the toilets, they have the stairs, and they have the lifts. The toilets, the stairs, the lifts. These are just studies of different types of enclosures for the atrium. But much more important is, you start to give you a three-dimensional three development of the scene. It's no longer a flat facade, less or more beautifully enclosed in glass, brick, stone, or whatever, but a three-dimensional building with views from a distance at skyline and as you approach it on the diagonal. And these are narrow streets. And so you wrap this round, and it drops down to the smaller buildings Next slide, please.
It drops down to the south towards the smaller buildings and up higher to the north to the P L and C U buildings. And the building attempts to start to link some of the Victorian buildings. It no longer is a building which we hope which is only worth one glance, however perfect that detail may be, but it is actually worth a series of glances. Because it reads piece by piece, it unveils itself as you approach, and you approach on the diagonal. And in the city of London, you practically always approach on the diagonal, and therefore that has to be taken into account. As GE streets, law courts take into account the, the, the verticality elements in GE streets, in my opinion, holds the road much more successfully <coughs> with all its re-entrance, with all its spaces behind, much better than a flat surface, because you're approaching it on the diagonal. You see these verticals, and the skyline is broken, and the ground, the other key line, is also broken. Behind that are quiet and private spaces, so that as you approach it, it holds the street, which is what we wish to do here, because there's no reason for the, the nature of the city is not one of squares and, uh, and places in the large scale, but it's small and tight. But there is a problem of traffic and fumes and noise, and you want to be able to get away from that. And in the sense of using G Street's law courts as an example, you can retreat behind the screen, and here you'll find gardens and courts and spaces. And here too we hope that as you approach low lawns from the bank and it holds that, that, <coughs> that great street, and as you go closer, so the spaces become more private, and so you find that you can sink in and you start to enter the building and you start to get the bench, the small scale space and so on. Next. <coughs> and the skyline, whether it's the city of London or whether it's Siena and the space, is an immensely important situation. And if you, we look at these rather, what we now I think find rather monotonous, oversimplistic, somewhat scaleless buildings of the 50s and 60s. And we look towards a more articulated skyline to give some form of excitement and enjoyment, which is, at the same time, built out of a functional basis, because functions will give a guideline. Of course, out of that, you can never make an architecture on its own. You have to choose the path that you will play, that you're going to use. So there's lawyers, there are the towers, there are the stairs, there's the articulation, the structure, and the elements, because we basically believe that buildings should be legible. All buildings are legible. And if they're going to be legible, you may as well make it as clear as possible. So you can tell what is the service tower, what is the lift, and by taking a lift up, you can have a great view across London. Why should you go into a, a lift lobby, which is dark and dingy, go into a lift, which is dreary as hell, and go up and pop out somewhere into a long, lengthy, boring interior corridor? when the whole thing can be a fabulously exciting moment, process. You go instead into a lift, you look, and as the lift mounts, so you see across the city, the town, the place. You don't go in through internal corridors, you try to go through air corridors which at least have views out, not just a series of doors. So the excitement of the place becomes part of the way of life. Next. That is one of the service towers, or an early study of one of the service towers, which served the basic four-square solid <coughs> building behind, where all the work gets done. These are the elements which can be ripped out and replaced, the stairs, the toilets, the HV, the heating and ventilating. Heating and ventilating takes about 20%, probably 30% of the volume of the building, way beyond any other single element by the actual use of the building. Usually it's hidden behind the plaster and so on. But if we're talking about legibility, a gray and a scale, a layering, an interest which is belong, but goes beyond the flat surface, then we may as well use that as part of our alphabet, part of our language. And so here you have the air conditioning elements, the heating, the, 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 the pipes. And who is ever to say that the pipes are any different, of a different value than perhaps the structure? And as far as technology is concerned, I think any form, I don't believe this word of high technology or low technology, the only technology which is, pro is probably the appropriate technology, both to the econ economics of that country and to the ability in which, to which you can use that technology. We happen to be interested in this situation, unlike other situations, we have worked in much poorer countries. 
um, you know, prefabrication. And here you see the good old caravan, American, um, and the possibility of plugging in elements like this and creating a prefabricated system where the toilets, for instance, arrive totally pl plumbed in. And with to us, this gives us a certain excitement. The possibility where these elements can have three or four walls totally separate from the rest of the building, in other words, totally articulated, where there's space beyond those, those walls, where there's light and shadow beyond those walls, not just a square tile. Next. <coughs> I will pick up speed. I think you can read that as a framework, the sort of thing that tends to, one of the things that it tends to interest <coughs> is the possibility of lifting that on a crane, fully finished, and plugging it in. This is the one of the latest models of Lloyd's from Leadenhall Street. We have conserved the old arch, which continues the street along there. We've created a new passageway, which is a new pedestrian passageway, which links up with the old Leadenhall Market. There's a sunken area all the way around Lloyd's, which, is, which has shops, the eating areas, and so on, the low areas. This is the principal entrance, but there are entrances of each of these towers. And this is the articulation of the elements, which stand proud and upright and are taut outside the building against the flatter facade behind. But in all elements, you read, and it is legible, what is going on, how the building stands up, what are the clothes that it's wearing, and why it's wearing those clothes. Next. These are just studies in relation to both images which we interest us, the served and servant areas, and the same sort of thing there. Next. The white area on this area, obviously, is the area which the, the, the four square element of the box is the area which will last much, is likely to last much longer than these areas here. But you can demolish parts of the tower, the whole tower, tower at a time, and still life will continue behind in this four square part of the building. This is the old gateway, the sort of mo the, the monument to the 1928 Sir Edwin Cooper building, not one of Edwin Cooper's best buildings. Um, but of some, but worth remembering and using, and we have used this, as I said, as a passageway, they call the Green Passage, which was uh, to, for the public, to the street, to the market behind. So it's a new passageway. And here, here again, you see the articulation, the attempt to create a statement. I mean, Lloyd's is not just a, in my opinion, it is not just an ordinary simple office building. It actually has a very important role. Insurance, the second biggest bank, the second biggest economic uh, centre <coughs> after banking within the city of London. It's quite a definite, important part of British history and part of uh, British economics. And therefore its role is probably more than the somewhat flat facade of a typical office building such as that. And that is a view down one of the streets. That's the CU, CMU building over here. There's a square which in my opinion shouldn't be there. In front of the CU there, there's not a bad square there. And that is one of the corners. That is the anchor corner. So the key corner is the entrance to the whole of Lloyd's. And that anchors the building down on that one corner with a strong, definite statement. Next. Just very briefly, touching on energy research. I mean, a building which has always interested me ever since I did my history thesis in the AA. Uh, which is the Chirot House, and the whole question that the difference between uh, in buildings is not just solid and transparent, but also translucent, and all the stages in between transparent and solid. The Chirot House is a great piece of, I believe, design technology, but specifically here I want to talk briefly about the translucence of the glass, translucent here, the way it glows, the way it's a wall of light, and the transparent insets of the small windows in there, and some of that we're using in here again, um, where we're using three layers of glass, two of the normal layers of trans translucent glass, and then the, we're actually circulating the air from the temperature through the glass, so you have a third layer. So the duct, so the glass itself here, is acts, all the skin of this building acts as part of the ducting system. Air is actually moved through the skin in an attempt to be, be energy conscious. What is it? And there is the top of the atrium building and the building stepping down towards the smaller buildings here and over here would be CU and the much, much taller buildings on that side here. The public arcaded area all the way around the building at this level here. Next. Uh, 
and this is our work on the whole question of, of light transparency, reflection, or refraction, and the need to study energy and the new forms that will come out from that. Because I said, in a sense, the, the interest for me of myself into science is the fact that it gives you a handle on, to, on form. It gives you a possibility to study in not a pure, purely artistic formal way, in which I personally get totally lost but a way which allows me, guides me towards decisions of how to make changes so that the building no longer has to be just a rectangle with a roof pitched or flat but can start to take <coughs> different forms because of the way it reacts to the environment so here in California in the, in the desert with the energy saving walls or the translucence of those pieces there Next. Sorry, that's upside down, if you can stand on your head. Um, what it really says is that the normal architect's role, realm of study is that the normal, the, the normal realm is the building area, which is basically building. There's building, from there to there's building. And it goes at one end into the environment, it just begins to edge into the environment, that's environment, and it begins to edge into components. And what I'm suggesting is that as a handle, as a way of assisting us in understanding the needs of people and buildings, we should extend that realm beyond that, into the macro, into the micro, into the environmental planning systems, and also into the micro scientific end. And by extending it, we get these handles into the, which guide us, which allows us to hold the technology and therefore the form of the buildings. This is just a slide of a, a student who came to see me and he showed me the slide, and, uh, and he said, um, Dutch student, and he said, uh, all right, one of the things that I did is I had an old bicycle, and uh, when I was 15, of course, in, in Holland, we're not allowed to have bicycles, which are motorcycles, so I put the motor in a handbag, and when the police approach me, I close the handbag, and then I open it when I want to go zooming down the street. I think it's a great invention. It's fantastic. I don't know it's low technology. <laughs> Invention. Next. And obviously the technology, whether it's gliders or whether it's sailing boats and the, and the way that it answers uh, so cleanly the, its basic needs. But I would like to just add a, a sort of a little piece. Obviously whether it's a glider, a sailing boat or a spacecraft, the advantages of those buildings, of those elements, is they don't have to relate to anything but themselves. They can be pure technology. <coughs> we have the constraint, and I believe the game of architecture is to convert constraints into advantages. I stress that. The whole idea is not to panic. It's a cheap building, but it can be a great building. It's, it, it, it's a difficult building, but it still can be a good building. And the question is to relate the or change that constraint of the environment around, and that will affect that building. So you can't just take it in its pure isolation, but there is an interest. And here, where we're building in the middle of a field where it's already easier to take the determinants and simplify those to determinants, we had to do a shed, which has just been completed in a local authority shed in France, in Compare, Brittany, a local authority money, and we said to ourselves, amongst other things, we said, what can we do with LA local authority money at a minimal cost? And also a beautiful hill near the seaside, which isn't just a box, and we said, well, one way is to use tension steel, which always has interested us, because after all, tension doesn't, steel and tension doesn't buckle, therefore you can use much thinner elements, you can hang yourself with a fuse wire, but you sure can't stand on it, because it buckles, um, and therefore you can hold things with that, you can cut down by the steel by some 15% by using it in tension, and therefore you can use some of that money into the fabrication process, so it's so you can actually sort of handle the elements and express it. And this is a very cheap, 30 foot high, it's very hard man sort of way down here. Um, a, a door is that element there, uh, those first three squares. Um, and create a building which is cheap, but it is of some in visual interest within the total landscape. Next. Next. Back to cities, and very briefly, Boberg, and here again, perhaps Boberg is uh, a, an example of what I have been talking about in the sense of when we were 
asked to do the competition, people said to us, or the, uh, we were told, we buy, buy, the, buy the brief. This is to be a museum, a library, and a center of design, which is to be a monument to Pompidou. And we all said, yag, yag. Um, and so what we try to do is to make it a place which is fun, both for the people who are passers-by, as well as the people who use it, but also to attract a spectrum of people who do, would not normally go there, what Peter Cook, I suppose, would call mums and dads. Um, in other words, a cross-section, blue or white collar, young or old. Could we make something, and I'm going to say we, of course, this has been, was discussed by Archie Graham, by Frederick <coughs> Price's Fun Palace, a whole wide variety of things for many years, and could we actually create and capture some of this, this uh, enjoyment? Could we make it a popular rather than an elitist statement? And also the whole question of growth and change and the possibility of creating a plan, in this situation here, twice the size of a football pitch, which you could do anything on, whether it's a library, a museum, a university, or whatever it may be, and then articulate the building with mechanical services on one side, on the street side, because that's the street and that's the narrow street side, and on the other side where people walk and position the building. So you have a great piazza because in front, which, and the building acts as a stage prop, and as I said, as a theater scene to that sunken amphitheater, so that people standing here, would, this is a competition model, that's a competition plan, uh, the people standing here would look at the building and the building would look at the cats and there would be a, a relationship between these two elements. And on the back you would hold a street, good and hard and noisy and solid. And on that you'd have all the ducks and the stink and the smell. And you would communicate with the rest of the world through a whole series of um, audiovisual mi micro-communications, though micro-communications are hardly in existence, but that type of thing upon the roof and this signal this to the rest of the world. And this would become a center which would stretch out and try to stretch beyond just being a place where you go through the doors and they open and they say, this is a beautiful object. It's more than that. It's a place to have fun. Next. And it has fun, but it's changing fun because whatever may be here will be different in a very short time. In fact, during the change takes place in, obviously, uh, in many ways. It takes place during the building of a building. Practically no building we've ever built has been open on the day of opening has, been, uh, has answered the brief. The original brief has always had to be changed. This is the original competition drawing, major facade, there's the sunken piazza, the idea of an enjoyment ride, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, Piazza de España, the steps, but only in, in, in escalators, in, in an enjoyment across the facade, not a static element, because after all we are a few hundred years later. The idea of lifts which are on the outside, the tension of the steel and the legibility of the structure, and the possibility of using the outside of the building as an audiovisual layered screen to communicate what goes on in the building, what goes on in the area, what goes on in the country, and what goes on in other countries. And so the building is an information dispersal center and a place where you can participate. And that is a section, again the same, the section through the building showing the number of large floors spanning from one side to the other and the antennae to stretch out to the rest of the world. I believe architecture is much about hope. Next. <coughs> and the building nearly completed, not quite completed at this point, at the beginning of the use of the piazza, the definition of the square, and the articulation, the light and the shadow and the escalators. And the fact that I believe that was enclosed in the skin, that building would look absolutely massive. Many people still say it's out of scale. But anyhow, massive, but because it's full of light and scale and area and articulation, it begins to, I believe, link in with the more articulated but smaller facades of the buildings around. And a section through that building showing the, the corridor. The corridors are external. The structure is legible. The form of the structure, and here again we work from day one with the engineers, as Peter Cook was saying the other day, we, in England we have, I think, not only very good engineers, which we do have, but I think in the sense there's still a tradition of using those engineers from day one. Whilst I believe that is not so any longer in most countries, I am more than concerned when I go to the States and find that really what architects are now doing are purely putting less or more beautiful facades on buildings developed by developers 
and then the developer does a building, he calls the engineer, the engineer says, prop this up for me, and the architect then sticks on the facade. I feel that architecture is, has more to it than that. At least I hope it has. It's much, should be deeper. It actually, I believe, has a, a part, plays a part in the everyday life of, this, of the city, or the country, or whatever it may be. There's the sunken piazza, the corridors and these glazed tubes, the escalators, the columns which are water-cooled, the mechanical services at the back, the big forum where the piazza stretches into, the piazza, the external space stretches into the roof. This is all public, a little bit like noise, but of course a much better and bigger, much better public statement. But also the facades, the, the facades, sorry, the piazza stretches into the building at ground level and also up to the outside. They're not private outsides, the facades belong to the people who pass by as much as the people who live in. Next. Uh, roofscape. The only part of this makes is that we were the first to believe that mechanical services should be on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and the hard street edge, Notre Dame, I'm sorry, left to right this slide is William. Notre Dame at the, end, at the end of the of the street here and the sort of highly articulated facades here and the articulation of these, of the building on the, on the service side, the, the um, service lifts, the ducts and so on. Next. If you can remember that slide there, it also makes the point, which is one which I am again very interested in, and that is that we have talked for ages, some of us have talked for ages, about flexibility in plan, flexibility in section. I, we are searching for flexibility in elevation. I don't believe, and I believe there are many ways of doing architecture, but I am the architecture that we're interested in, don't believe that you should create such a beautiful dollhouse facade that if you put one curtain in it, it bursts, it breaks, it's finished. That you have to re write rules that says, you will not do this because otherwise this building will collapse in, its vision, in the visual terms. That it should be sufficient layering and sufficient series of hierarchy of components from large to small. I believe that should be sufficient so that if you do change a part, the building still survives. And if you even change quite large parts, the building survives. And what again, going back to Lloyd's, what we're saying is, so you can rip the service tiles out. And then of course there will be different, smaller probably, in the future. So what? It should add to the excitement that it will change. It's got to, the building has got to be able to have that transformation, which many historic buildings also had in the sense of Roman buildings and so on. But even more nowadays, because we know more about components and Meccano kits and so on, and the building can withstand that type of treatment, can be actually not easily withstand, but enriched by that type of treatment, by the fact that I like pink and you may like black. And that the building is enriched, and in that sense is a theatre, is a stage. Details, and here again, this question of the engineer and the closeness of the, of the engineer to the architect, and the study of how can you, if you're going to span 160 feet across, and that's what you're spanning, which is a very large span, from one column to another, how can you cut back on the amount of steel? One way is to pull it down at the ends, there's the beginning of the beam here, and this is what is termed a Gerberet after a 19th century engineer who did the first types of these of, of calculations on this, of this type of building. Nothing is new. And that's one of the Gerberets, the fast, the biggest cast steel elements. Um, and the way it all puts together, all like your Meccano. And there's one of the Gerberets being cast, and the whole excitement for myself of visiting these sort of factories. And that's a Gerberet, the column goes through here, a great big vertebrae. And that gives you an idea of the scale of these small elements on the facade of the building. And obviously, if those are strong enough, then you can do a hell of a lot on the outside, and you still won't lose it. And the form and the excitement, and though obviously, the calculation is the key. You still have to make a decision. The architect still makes a decision about what is all this about. How do you unscrew this? What is the form of that element? Um, you know, anybody, I mean, a spoon is a spoon. There's a hell of a difference between a good, well-designed spoon and it's not all functional. It relates to the source of the cup and all other elements. And that's, again, where the architect has to make certain decisions. Next. Again, this whole question of movement of vertebrae is one of my favorite shots, the major kind of columns, waterfill columns, the beginning of the collar around that, with the, with, which is the collar, which is uh, for the gerberet. It's dropped on and then clips into place, that which is why it has to have movement space around here, and the way you tighten these up to, to get the 
uh, and build up the tension and build up a, uh, an external skin structure which allows the building to stop the building from collapsing from side to side. And the dry component of this guy holding onto this sort of 50 ton beam and dropping it into place on the back of the 10 ton gobarette. Next. And the sort of joint, the enjoyment of that joint. Um, the forum space, the large railway space where anything can go, <coughs> where you can have anything from jazz concerts as you go into the building of Boburg to um, you know, the museum, the more elite elements, the library, and so on. And they all use this, whether it's a market or whether it's a place to make speeches. It's the sort of the continuation of the street into the building. And the library, the library was going to be a million books, uh, and uh, <coughs> it served from a central floor, and uh, people would go to the, center, to the central of three floors and ask for a book. And within about eight, two years of starting the scheme, it became quite clear that, first of all, there would never be the staff to give out books, and you'd have to help yourself. And secondly, that a million books was fine, but micro-communications and audiovisual equipment was, more, was better. And uh, fifth, there are only half a million books, and the rest is taken up by audiovisual equipment, which you can't see here, but it, but it which draws 12,000 people per day here, the way it was calculated, that we would actually draw 1,000 people. The library is the, by far the most successful space. Uh, it draws so many people, everybody sits on the carpets, um, and it is absolutely packed, and it needs to be extended. Next. And it's packed by all sorts of people, people watching films, people watching slides, people taking books. The facade of, of Bobo, um, the sort of structure which I'm wearing, I'm saying it doesn't really matter whether it's solid, whether it's pink, whether it's red, what's behind here doesn't matter. And even in parts of this, it's sufficiently strong to make its own grain and scale within the urban texture to take that change. And a very early building, which couldn't take change, but a building which was probably the first building which we did in technological terms, Reliance Control, in 1966. Um, and from which we learnt a little bit our lesson, that's with Norman Foster, uh, because we did this building, it was quite successful for a few months until it was sold yet again to somebody else who said, Christ, I want windows in this. And you can imagine what happened. <laughs> I haven't got the slide. I can't take the slide, it hurts. <laughs> Next. Um, and so we're looking for, as I said, a lesson from, I suppose, if you like, one of the land controls and others is, how can we create an architecture which is tougher, coarser, whatever you like to call it, but still is an architecture. Um, and the fun, and, you know, I think it's something like, I don't remember the figures any longer, but um, a vast number of people come here. It is more than the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre put together, to ask to answer Peter's figure. Uh, I think there is an average of 25,000 people a day, and we were programmed, given a brief of 5,000 people a day. A maximum of 50,000 people a day uh, come through it. And people draw people. And that's again, is for me, a key statement, or key, key excitement. Which somehow I find often lacking in, perhaps if I may say so, in London. In other words, I never know what to do on a Saturday afternoon if you don't happen to like football, or cricket, or pubs. Um, you become an outsider. And um, whilst here, people, Paris specifically, you really go to Paris to watch other people. You stay on a cafe winter or summer to watch people go by. People from everywhere, anybody can after all, go to a cafe. Um, it's cheap and great, and, and, and you can do your, your homework, your, your, your whatever else you like, all at a cafe table. In fact, even more in Italy, businesses are run from the cafe coffee table. Whole businesses. I know insurance business, I know lawyers. We don't have offices, they have a table in a cafe. <laughs> I'm all for it. It's cheaper and better. <laughs> More exciting. And people know where you are and they drop in to see you. And they don't feel this whole question of opening a door or closing a door. And I'm all for that. Too. And so what this says is, but if 50,000 people come on a good Sunday, then all the rest of the people come back from all over the world to start to collect the advantages of that, like a few pennies, cents, or whatever it may be, francs. And so you have mime, so you have jazz, so you have trios, so you have a whole play of eaters and all the rest, and people start to circulate, forming great shapes in themselves. And so 
an art, a form of culture, because after all, mine is a culture in France, it really is, starts to formulate outside the limitations, the enclosures of those museum elite walls, in, and out into the street. Coins of Cedric Price's term, University of the Street. And something like, I said 15%, I believe the figure was, or is it 20%? Well, the people never go into the buildings. Fine, they just use the escalators. They go up and down the escalators and watch the people. That's, that's all right. Some of them might one day drop in if they, want to, if they wish to look in the library and then perhaps into the children's area. And the Boberg itself is divided to a, not only what we call the programmed areas, using the word program as brief as an American, <coughs> but a whole team, led by Stanford, for instance, which study the non-programmed areas by the activities not written in the brief. And again, it's the architect's role to read between the lines, to extend that brief explain to the clan, what are the advantages of extending that brief? Next. I'll get quickly through this and we'll be here all night. Um, again, the back facade of the building, the back, I call that facade on the street. <coughs> again, it's not just a quiet little office building, it is a vast center for culture, the biggest center I've even in Europe. It has the best art collection in the world of modern art, poss with possible exception of the museum, of the, uh, mu uh, museum in, in, in New York, the MoMA. Um, you know, it has the best library in, in, in France and so on. So the building has some pride to stand there. Um, and outside it collects all these sort of activities which we have tried, we tried to encourage, right in the competition brief, we stated in the first paragraph, the museum, this building should belong to the people. <coughs> now, of course, it depends how you use it. We have, um, Pompidou died uh, just before the building was completed. Just got tried to stop it, robbed most of the finance from it, or whatever money he could lay his hands on, and then refused to, up, to, 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 uh, to uh, keep it. And interestingly enough, Mitterrand has now reversed the situation. We never know where, where you're standing in this situation. Mitterrand has given back the same money to Pompidou Center that uh, Pompidou had given. But in the meanwhile, a lot of the tents and things like that have been removed, and now they're coming back again. And the building is beginning to get more life again, better life. Though it has always been a major center, and to sort of quote, I think it was uh, the Minister of Culture, which said, in a sense, this has helped to make the right bank in Paris the left bank, and to bring the light, sort of life that used to be only found in the left bank back into this old history. Next. That's the final s slide on the Beauberg. Um, again, as I said, it's a place which, uh, where culture is of all levels. Finally, I want just to talk about Coin Street. For me, Coin Street has been a place which, apart from spent the last three or four years ar arguing with the bureaucracy of this country, which can't make its mind up yes or no, or no, and it appears to me to have totally lost any form of confidence in any form of decision making whatsoever. After all, the simplest thing to do is to say no. If you say no, you'll always be safe. <coughs> Um, that is the site, the grey area, the grey area is the site, <coughs> as shown here, Waterloo Station, Waterloo Bridge, the major magnets, Waterloo Station itself, the office area, the second, I believe, the largest conglomeration of offices outside the City of London, that's the GLC here, Shell, and all the other offices around here, the largest cultural centre in, certainly in Europe, if not the world, in this area here, National Theatre, Festival Hall, Queen, Queen Elizabeth, and so on, in this area here, London Weekend Television, and the King's Reach Development. And what we've tried to do is to create a linking, pulling metropolitan magnet, because I believe the site is of metropolitan as well as of local importance. In other words, it is on the unique bend of the Thames, it's the hell of the Thames, pun the Thames punches into the centre, of London at this point. It's the, it's the bend, this big bend, which is really quite a fabulous place. And it's bang opposite anyhow, Westminster, 
Parliament, there, that is uh, Westminster Bridge here, the Jubilee Walk all the way along here, and all the centre of London, in the sense of the points I made, mentioned before, such as Trafalgar Square, Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus, and all those elements which are just in this area up here, St James Park, and so on. So I believe this to be part of the centre of London. This shows a thousand metre walk from this point here, and a 1,500, 15 minute walk on the outside. And what it says is, you could walk from here to most of the centre prop areas of London. And this is the key catchment area if you form a link across the Thames. And the Thames is a barrier in London. It's a very strange situation, unlike most rivers which are much more <coughs> of, or of, sort of the rivers of the scale which, uh, which can like the Seine, where you zigzag across on the Seine. The Seine is about a third narrower than, but that's all, a third narrower than, than the Thames. But the big advantage of the Seine is that bridge goes from, bridges go from bank to bank. In London, bridges somehow are step way back. So the bridge starts outside Waterloo Station and goes way down to Woolwich, thereby tripling the distance of the river, or the extension of the river. So that in itself is a, creates a bigger barrier, a bigger gap between the south, the poorer south, poorer in the sense that it has not the richer public institutions of the north in back and over here. And it is this weaving together of north and south and of this clump of this first area here, this person in the sense of the housing is, or the market and the housing and so on here, is all, are all in a weak position. Um, everything is changing. There is this very pleasant housing here, the Coyton Street housing area. Most of it is now being bought by the workers in London Weekend Television and IBM, because it's Victorian housing, it's not local authority housing, and, what, and it's going for a small fortune because people want to use it for the offices here. So the whole area is going through a question of change. And so the question is, how do you weave it? How, you, how can you create some form of infrastructure which will enrich London and the locality, bring this area to life? And this shows a linking from Waterloo Station, a pedestrian link, which starts at Waterloo Station with a quarter of a, mile, quarter of a million trips a day, a day. That's an unbelievable sum. So if one's looking for 1% or whatever it is, which might walk through this street <coughs> to, the, to London itself in this area, and this area over here. Um, and also obviously the National Theatre and all the high wind-blown walkways and the concrete massing along here. Perhaps you can weave all that together because it's nearly on the edge of beginning to work. Because you're beginning to get that sort of activity over here. If you go outside the film theatre, for instance, people are beginning to play uh, musical instruments on Hungerford Bridge. Even though the trains come along and kill every sound, you do find an occasional trumpeter who plays in between the, ro the noise of the trains. Very English. <laughs> Next. <coughs> that is the site itself. The site has, and the site which we're working on, has no uh, key buildings, with the possible exception of the Oxo Tower, which is there, which is a strange building which comes out of a rather dreary uh, warehouse and then pops out two-thirds up and suddenly you have this rather nice top shift over here. That is London Weekend Television, a pretty dreary building, and Shell, which is a disaster. Um, in my opinion, it's a disaster, not because it's less or more beautiful, I think it's bloody awful even visually, but I have had this discussion here before, but because what it does to the public area is nothing. It, is, it forms exactly what I started this discussion with. It forms a barrier to the public. Shell promised, as a planning game, for instance, to give uh, sports activities, and shopping and so on, <coughs> to the people in Shell. On the day of opening, it said, I'm sorry, gentlemen, you can't enter Shell to use this. There's a problem of security. And therefore, Shell is a totally private development upon a site which of public importance with the National, with the Festival Hall, with all these activities, and forms a major barrier. <coughs> But apart from that, most of this is car parking, warehousing, and so on. And this shows the link, the major link which we're trying to establish between Waterloo Station and its, and its trippers through the site to the city of London over here, to St. Paul's, which is about a mile away from here, to Trafalgar Square, all that, and St. James's, Westminster, all which are within that easy mile walk over here, and linking in also to the South Bank Cultural Centre. And along that, we're saying, Long this, this can be a glazed street. 
And that glazed street, we're saying, doesn't have to have, it must not create a barrier. You must have north-south movement places, which are these lines here, so that you can easily go through the street. And the street, due to our environment, is glazed. And along the street is a whole series of activities, whether it's shops, whether it's restaurants, whether it's cinemas, or whether it's related to water activities. And these are the activities, whether it's ship chandlers, whether it's a small island in the river, which is this thing here, whether it's a sunken piazza, which is over here, because the wind howls back from over here. And again, green areas, as such, in my opinion, for most of London, is just an excuse. Green area, an open area on the north, on this bank here, is just a wind-blown area. If you want to see one, you can just go back next to the, to the GLC or the Jubilee Gardens, with, and I say I have been there now for 10 months and I know exactly what goes on in that area, I watch from the GLC from when I'm being cross-examined and watch the fact that practically nobody uses this great big green area next to the GLC, perhaps this area here, because it's windblown. So we are trying here to create a sunken room, a place where people could come and participate. And these are a series of buildings along the spine and housing along, along here. Next. A model showing the same thing over here. There is the <coughs> Waterloo Station. We have tried to work with the GLC to take this ghastly bullring, one of the worst, largest peace squad in the west of the world, <laughs> um, and suggest that this could become a center for again, both public activities and possibly offices over the top. So that there's a use, it's not just a great big roundabout, which leads through with Waterloo Station into this glazed street. This glazed street extends from um, glazed gateway, glazed pavilion, and these sort of transparent things of pavilions, low pavilions between the buildings, which you <coughs> find the north-south major routes, along with the Jubilee route, road. And the whole this becomes pedestrianized, so that these are pedestrian routes which are outside, so if you want on a sunny day, you, don't, you come across and take us the out external route, to the river and they take the bridge across, or you can take it on a rainy day or cold day, the internal route, or you can walk across the amphitheater and then the highway across it. And we try and we continue the existing road patterns which are there across here so that we start to link up and weave in with the existing buildings the routes which already historically exist when we convert them back to pedestrian. Because after all, this is a metropolitan place of some, and it should not be cut up just for car parking and cars and vehicles. And this is a view down of the glazed gallery, that is office buildings on the left and right, that is the sort of atrium or glazed street, and this is one of the glazed gateways. In fact, that one there is that glazed gateway there, which connects and is a public activity area and connects at this level here, at the ground level. Next. A key point, perhaps the key point, which I'm going to make as far as this is concerned, is that we have said no officers will hit the ground. The only point where officers above the buildings on the spine, that is the great spine, and that is the which varies in its form as you walk along, the only point where the officers hit the ground at these, are these orange points, totally <coughs> between 2 and 3 percent of the total area. Below that are, is the shopping list of public activities, leisure, and shopping, and fun, and the Santa Piazza, and so on, and housing. So the ground, the ground area, and this has been sort of what we've been trying to get across, is handed back to public use in this key metropolitan site. This is one of the earliest views from the river, and here again you have the articulated towers, and the, this time the building is stretching between the articulated towers, and these are the office buildings, and then at ground level, the, pit, the public areas where people traditionally walk through the scheme from north, south, east, and west. Next. That is as it is now where it sort of builds up to a gateway as it crosses the river on this, tent, on this bridge. This is the tension bridge held by that tension, tension court here. And the glazed street at ground level, uh, with these shops, 
going all the way through and linking up back here with water station, which must be somewhere here, Shell, London Weekend Television, and the offices above here, Sunken Piazza in this area here, Run, uh, sorry, the National Theatre and I, IBM and so on. It has intrigued me, the amount of discussion that's been about conserving the river by setting the buildings back on the bend. As far as I'm concerned, the best way of losing the bend of the river is to set the buildings back, which is the policy uh, on the board. Uh, the best way of losing the river is to actually set those buildings back. Again, it's one of those terrible compromises. Uh, I would suggest that the way that we Docklands and the docks handle the river, where the space along the river is strongly defined by the buildings themselves, is a much better solution than the solution of stepping back. And if you think of a site, surely if you have this fabulous river, you want to find the space. The river has a justification for its own space. It's a positive space, not a space that leaks over all these wishy-washy buildings. Some of them are better than others. <laughs> Next. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, hold it. This is a typical plan at office level. The cores, <coughs> toilets, prefabrication, stairs, mechanical services, fires, lifts, lifts, and so on. And a standard office element, which can be anything again because an offer is nothing to there's no walls. This, this could be, we can't draw plans to show that if in 25 years' time it all changes into housing, it will perform perfectly well, perfectly well as housing. After all, it would be very easy to convert into simple floor space. Certainly easier than the, than the Georgian warehousing, which I think is terrific for housing anyhow. It is really a warehouse floor. And you can convert it into its workshops or whatever it is quite easily because these are the only fixed elements, and those elements themselves can be easily ripped out and changed and the structure of the other outside and the street. And you have this layering, this articulation, which I've been talking about, this whole question of what architecture is about, which is obviously, again, visually, it is about the play of light and shadow. Next. Sorry, one moment again. And there again <laughs> is the gaps, the key gaps between the buildings going linking up with the hinterland, <coughs> with the housing behind, through these gaps here, and, the, and these articulated towers. Next. Hold it there, I think we'll keep those two together. We'll see what happens. Can you keep, go back one, I think we're out of, out of first, something like that. Right. And that is the elevation of that building shown as it is at the moment. That's London Weekend Television. That's uh, Seaford's Tower over here. That's housing. And these are the gaps again linking back through the, through the scheme and the Jubilee Wall running in the front. Next. Change both, please. In this one. Great. Just briefly, housing. The housing is in the form of a four-story court housing around a public, a small garden in front, public, uh, a semi-private space, you know, and as the, a, a larger block defining the river over here. Um, and that is basically, if you can see, that's the sort of the, the elevation of the housing which forms and which is formed by the roots, and it's really the key thing are these roots, these roots which go through, this root which comes through, and goes right the way through between IBM and London Weekend, uh, sorry, between the National Theatre and the uh, IBM, IBM and London Weekend Television, so these roots go through, punch through at these elements, at the, uh, the housing is developed between those roots. Next. And the Galleria, Milan, obviously a great... Here again is this question of, you know, we get immensely concerned, and rightly so, by private development and offices. On the other hand, with the other, we also have to accept that the only way in the 20th century when even the kids, children are not allowed to have milk at schools, that this scheme is ever going to be developed is if it is commercially viable. That in itself is not bad or good. It certainly isn't. It is how you organize that. Here, offices are, are above ground. Therefore, at street level, which is what counts, it, this, the activities, the zone, is a public zone. Then here we're trying to develop the same. At this level here, 
is the public activity. The space is tight. We've tried to get tight with talk. The long route, it may only have a few people sometimes of the day. It shouldn't be large, it should be tight, taut, narrow, dynamic. That's the gallery, that's the buildings, that's the office spaces. They look down upon this um, glazed street. Next. And one's conscious of what's going on below as well, below in the streets, in the service areas below. Next. Spain. I, again, I'm very intrigued by this question, not only this, this two things. One is the public zone, <coughs> that is so clearly the public zone, whether it's Bologna, whether it's Italy, whether it's, whether it's Spain, but also what you can do with a facade, still hold it, still keep it, still control it. It's this question of how do you create a flexible framework which has urban control. In other words, how do you, because after all, we have to keep some form of control in the urban quality. You can't just be total disorder. You have to create an order, but within that order there must be a flexibility. There must be able to change the pieces. A bit like jazz. Can you participate and change the elements and yet still hold the overall? Uh, but going back, the other point, as I said, is the street. The street is a place where you relax, enjoy, and have <coughs> lifestyle. And I believe strongly in this whole question of, you know, we're here to enjoy ourselves as well. And in a sense, what they're saying here, the ground belongs to the people, this is a glazed street, and being above that, not yet worked out, can we develop a form of articulation, a form of architecture, which is not dependent upon a single panel, but upon a variety of pieces, where there may be balconies where you need balconies, where there are blinds where you want blinds, where it's red where you want red or blue or green, it's round or square. Can this framework so be developed that it can respond to those needs? Next. That's a section through the scheme. That is actually the glazed gallery. I'm sorry, you can hardly see it. This, and that's the London Weekend television. That's all public. That's a sunken piazza here. And this gives you an idea of the land mass in relation to urban space. These are buildings, houses and buildings. Actually, these buildings are not around, semi round circus courtyards. Um, and these are the offices, and this is the glazed street. And across the river, and this is an island before you go across. And the bridge, bridge will be. I mean, the bridge is, it, it's a question of, as I said, to, of twisting the constraints into advantages. When I went to the developer and I said, we want a bridge, we said, and developers, in fact, to be quite honest, the developers saw it immediately, that the rents on this side of the river are 12 pounds a square foot. The rents on this side of the river are 24 pounds a square foot. So <coughs> maybe, if you put a bridge, you can add 2 pounds a square foot with all its length, To the north, and anyhow, the sort of people who like to take this building are people like Shell next here, and they are very keen, and would be uh, quite happy to pay their extra rent anyhow, so because they can still feel that they are on the north bank of the bridge. So where does the bridge come from? It comes out of the slightly extra evening out of the red between north and south banks. It's not something which is just thrown in. Next, I do believe again that obviously the, you know, the artist's job is to get a, a good grip of the side of the commercial element. Sketches, diagrams, articulations, offices, <coughs> this is just an early sketch, office area, the atrium, the uh, machinery, the servant areas, the servant areas, the office areas, the structure, the binding, and so on. Next. And slightly more. Developed the model showing one of the towers, the beginning of the office area. Uh, the fire escapes, the staircase, stairs back, back here, the toilet pods. These are the toilets there, the toilet pods. The entrance to the, to the offices, the office entrance mustn't be on the ground floor, because after all, the offices should not be on the ground. So the lobby is suspended actually over the uh, glazed street, in the centre of the glazed street, but at high level, it's just shown up over there. So you enter up the escalators, um, into the office lobby before being shot up one of these lifts up in here, into the offices, and across these stairs, these legs here, into the offices. <coughs> and the stale scale, and the grain, and the layering. Next. And the sort of gateway, it is a gateway, the gateway to the building, to the, to the, to the, sorry, to the south, to the south bank, 
and the chain of buildings, which end up, which start, if you like, at the GLC and Parliament at one end, and end up here before they go into the sort of Coin Street on this end here, and the bridge which links it at the beginning of, at, the, at this gateway. This is the tallest building; it's 14 stories up above the floor. Well, they new, but the discussions we're having whether it should be 13 or 14 stories, and whether 13 is okay, and whether 14 stories blows London to pieces is out of this world. Anyhow. Um, and what's wrong with shell? It's not whether it's whatever it is, 15 or, or 20, or 20 or 21 stories. That's not wrong with shell. Um, and that's the bridge, and the, and the uh, gallery is down to the piers, the small island, which allows the River Thames to be used. And after all, if we're going to use docklands, and if, and if, and I think it would be most logical to put an airport at the end of the Thames, from the Thames, and this could be a very fabulous route into London. And in fact, it would, it would be a great route so that the whole of Docklands could begin to depend on the Thames. And then things like this, these bus stops become very important with these gateways at the bus stop. And then away, there's the sort of the distance, the office buildings and the skyline and the sort of articulation of the skyline. And away comes the bridge with this big horseshoe element which ties itself back by a tension cable at the center of the bridge back to the offices behind. Next. Finally, the last half dozen slides. I just want to talk about, as I've spent so much time at the inquiry, about trying to explain something which has been explained so well by Colin Rowe, and that is that transparency is not just a gap between two buildings, and that glass is not transparent except if it's backlit. Glass, and this, what I think is a fabulous building by Noel Foster, Ipswich can be as black and as solid as marble. It can be taut, and it can be perfect, and it can be totally static. Transparency is not, obviously not in this slide show, reflection may be, but not transparency. Transparency can be either literal or phenomenal. If it's literal, it's as a gap between buildings certainly a gap between two buildings, though you actually usually can't see through the gaps. But if you happen to find someone you can line up, that can be a gap. But in most situations, it's phenomenal. In other words, it is a layering of light and shadow, in a series of layers, which plays one against the other, and which gives you the feeling, as again in G Street's law calls, of depth. And this play of depth against the, against the port skins and the rest. And the play of these different elements this layering of elements, which I find very interesting and which I hope might lead to a way in which we can play a much richer, much more enjoyable game than the, pure, the purity of some of the technology. Next. And the influence, obviously, of Louis Kahn's rigid, uh, rigid laboratory is the towers. The servant, the servant areas, the layering of that again, light and shadow. But the gap is unimportant whether it goes through or not. It's one of the you can have it going through. But much more important is the shadow here, the shadows, the scale of the vertical against the scale of these cantilevered elements. The small detail, God, that's important. That small little cutback, not in the later look. The last extension doesn't have that, which I think is a great pity. But the actual understanding here of the way the building is put together. Uh, that is just a, a sketch of the gap between two of the cores, uh, between two of the buildings, the core between two of the buildings in, in Coin Street. And the <coughs> public activity area, the lower area, which is shadow here, and the, these elements which shoot you up into these two at the moment office areas. Next. Larger and again, it's an interest which one I have, and we are we have as an, as an organization. It is trying to understand what a structure is, it allows you to play different games behind it. And the fact that, it's that buildings have a public facade, they are not private, they're not buildings which are just they're not just clothing which only you look use, but clothing which every all the passers by use. It is a stage, buildings are a stage, and for me, one of the greatest plans of all. Frank Lloyd Wright's Martin House 
where the transparency, where the articulation between garden, inside, outside, and so on, is so clear and amassing that the, the change of direction, the lit, one single, one direction of structure and, and elements, and then a change, an anchor at this element, and another anchor, and this play of solid and void. Next. Last slide. And really, the end is about enjoyment. It's about public enjoyment, private enjoyment. Thank you very much. And I, I really think that you had a very long day, and we won't uh, keep any longer for questions here. But we hope that you come back and see some of the work that the students have been doing on the Green Street site, perhaps in a fortnight's time. Thank you very much again.